Hey everybody, one another GMG review. Today we're taking a look at uh, Warhammer Age of Sigmar Battle Tome Chaos Blades of Corn. Yay, I got through it all. <laughs> These titles are getting bananas. Um, and this is the latest uh, in a series of double releases for Age of Sigmar. It feels like we're just pushing out the last bunch of books. We had Gloom Spike Gets. So we had Caradron Overlords by themselves. Before that we had Gloom Spike Gets and Beast of Chaos have their own like double release and now we're having Keyed Knights and Blades of Corn have their own double release. It, like it really feels like we're pushing to the finish line of third edition battle tomes and we are getting real close. We're just about, I think this might be it. We're real close. <laughs> I know we're real close. Um, and these two minor affiliations, well, minor affiliations, these two God-specific affiliations for 3rd edition Age of Sigmar brings the books up to the sort of current standard, adds grand strategies. You guys know the drill. You've watched a million of these. You know what it's going to add in. Um, and I'm going to go through what's new and what's different. I, I will say that this follows the same pattern as the previous Battle Tomes that have gone digital. Not digital. Gone 3rd edition. Um, where uh, it streamlines everything. There's a lot less, like, you have to, to get or... Um, you, if you do this, then you get that, and it's just pick a slaughter host. You get four core benefits. You've got a bunch of blood tithe points, like effects you can buy. Plus, you can summon demons. Um, you can have a bunch of allied characters uh, that have the mark of corn as coalition units, and then you can also have coalition demons too if you want. So it feels like a nice, simple build your army, fairly simple uh, 40k uh, world leaders codex sort of treatment of this battle tone. So starting off, let's just jump right in. What's going on with Corn? Corn's happy. There's war in the mortal realms. There's war across the Chaos Sphere. Everyone's still killing each other. Heads come off. Hooray. Um, it's hard for Corn to have a bad day in Warhammer because the whole game is about the thing he likes best. Slaughterhouse. There's six Reapers of Vengeance, Blood Lords, Baleful Lords, Gortide, Skullfiend Tribe, The Flayed. They've all got one power. They're in a two-page bifolds layout. Um, other key abilities, uh, the first one is Locust of Fury. Anybody who's a Blades of Corn Demon that's more than eight from the enemy has a five plus ward. Um, they keep that five plus ward until they get into combat. So basically it's your deliver me into combat, whatever you're doing to me until then I get a five plus ward against because I'm trying to get to fight. But if they ever retreat during the battle, they lose it because they calm down or whatever. They're just trying to freak out to get there. Uh, murderous to the last. Every time a friendly Bloodbound model is slain, something with the Bloodbound keyword, um, pick an enemy within three and roll a die. It's called a murder roll. On a five plus to take a mortal wound for that slain model. If it's a hero, roll three dice instead of one. So everybody explodes and they die. It's basically a better uh, Stormcast turned to lightning. It's like a better Thunder, thunder Cloud Thunderstruck, whatever the Thunder thing is. <laughs> thunder is a Thunder host. Um, I think that's really ironic that the Bloodbound are better at it than they are. Uh, they got Hatred of Sorcery. Everyone with Blades of Corn is a keyword. Gets a 5 plus Ignore Spells roll. Just Ignore Spells roll. Sweet. Um, and then you've got the, um, the Legions of Chaos rule, which is your coalition rule. So two in every four units can be Slaves to Darkness with Mark of Corn or Mark of Chaos. Um, and then it's Mark of Chaos or Corn. It's either or. So you can take like this stuff that can't take Marks, which is kind of cool, but it can't be a wizard. And then one in every four in the army can be a coalition unit um, from the Beast of Chaos faction that does not have Zinch, Slanesh, or Wizard keywords, and they gain the corn keyword, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the coalition units don't stop you from using these allegiance abilities. Then finally, your blood tithe points. Anytime a unit dies, you get a blood tithe point. Um, there are additional ways from command traits and stuff of getting more. Um, at the end of your hero phase, you can spend blood tithe points on a reward. Um, the base one, which is one, there's eight of them, and they're all worth one to eight points. So the first one's one. It's three different units in the that with the Blades of Corn keyword can move D6 inches. They have to be three inches away from the enemy, so they can't move out of combat and stuff like that. But if you're unengaged, you can move D6 inches. Um, then the And they can finish this move within three inches of enemy units, which is kind of important because you can push them in for a free charge, basically, at the end of your um, hero phase. The Spell Eater Curse. Uh, you can spend Blood Tithe points on the reward in your opponent's hero phase immediately after a Wizard casts a spell, but before Unbinding Roll is made. That spell is automatically unbound. No unbinding roll. If the points on the, this reward, you can't spend any blood tithe points at the end of the same hero phase. So basically, if you do this one, then you can't do it at the end, too. Uh, so for three points, you can drop a Brass Skull Meteor, pick an enemy anywhere in the battlefield, and roll eight dice. For every five plus, take a mortal wound. Add two to the roll if they have a wound characteristic of ten or more, um, or have uh, ten or more models. 
So yeah, just drop the hammer from the sky for three. That one's gonna be real popular. And then Apoplectic Frenzy, pick a friendly blades core unit within three and they immediately fight. So for four points, just fight right away at the end of the hero phase. Uh, Rising Hatred, you can do this one more than once. Add one to your Hatred to Sorcery roll. So you get a four plus ignore, then a five plus. You can do that one up to two plus, I guess. Heads must roll, improve the rend uh, characteristic of melee weapons by friendly blades of core units up to one until the end of the turn. Uh, let the blood flow, this is seven. Roll one dice for each enemy in the battlefield uh, that's within three of any friendly blades of core units. And on two plus, I take D3 run of wounds. Everyone just freaks out for a second. And then finally, for eight points, Slaughter Triumphant. Add one of the attack characteristic of melee weapons made by friendly blades of core units until the end of the battle. Everybody just gets plus one to their attacks forever for eight. I mean, at that point, you're going to do one of two things in this game. You're probably going to either bank them up all the way to eight and then just add that in, at which point you probably don't have enough stuff left that it really matters. Or you're going to use these more tactical ones like auto unbind a spell, um, push guys into combat. The 1.1 1 .1, like, is really powerful. Um, and then if you've got it, like the pick to fight probably. The Brass Meteor and the pick to fight. I think you're going to see blood point type things 1 to 4 get used all the time and 5 plus are just never going to come into play really. They're not immediately powerful, and by the time you've banked up that many points, there's probably so much stuff. Unless, you're, unless your opponent specifically has tons of little units, like a Gloom Spider army with lots of tiny characters and stuff like that, you're probably not going to get it. Um, and then summons you can do at the end of your hero phase. If you have any blood tithe points left, um, and it's going to cost you up to 10 for a Bloodthirster. Uh, a Bloodletter host of 20 is 8. Um, Flesh Hound's unit of 10 models is 6. Bloodletter host of 10 models is 5. A Skull Cannon's five, a Blood Crusher's unit with three is five, a Herald is five, uh, Skull Master's four, Flesh Hounds with five is three, and a Blood Master is three as well, so you can still summon as well. Um, enhancements, these are your command traits. There are six of them, um, and there's some for Commander of the Blood Legions, which are demons, and then your uh, Corn Blood Bound, like, moral guys. So six demons, six, or sorry, four demon. And four, so there's eight total. And I'm my bad, of course there's eight total. It's four and four. <laughs> the, there's lots of middle capitalizes for keywords, and I thought it was extras. Um, embodiment of Wrath, start of the hero phase, roll dice for every friendly bloodthirster, holy within 16 of this general, on a two plus return D3 slain models to that unit. So basically, at the start of your hero phase, uh, at the start of your hero phase, roll a dice for each, oh, blood letter, not bloodthirster. All your bloodthirsters are within 16 of you, you get D3 guys back on a 2 plus. So basically you're, you're a blood a magnet for blood or blood letters. Uh, favorite of corn. <laughs> I read that wrong and I was like, I get D3 bloodthirsters back for a second, my brain just about broke. Uh, favorite of corn, if your general um, has this command trait, you begin the battle with a blood tithe point. Firebrand. This general becomes a priest if the general is already a priest and has additional blood blessing or blood blessing of corn. And then unrelenting hunter. At the end of the combat phase, if this general fought in that phase and is within three of the enemy, the general can make a piling move. Alternatively, at the end of the combat phase, if this general fought in the phases is more than three from the enemy, the general can make a normal move or attempt to charge. So you basically just stay in combat forever. Um, especially if you're a bloodthirster, I feel like Unrelenting Hunter is really powerful. If you have the ability to get an additional enhancement or additional, if you take a commander that's also a warlord, um, then the Embodiment of Wrath to get back your blood, blood letters might be good too. Uh... Uh, being a priest, maybe. I feel like the Unrelenting Hunter is probably the most powerful, and then the, the Embodiment of Wrath is probably the second one, if you're going with a, a Demon General. Uh, the Lords of the Blood Tribes, Blades of Corn, uh, Bloodbound, add one of the damage characteristic of attacks made by this general when they target an enemy hero, the Diabolical Purpose. A Barbarian Lord, add one to run charge rolls for this general, and for friendly Blood Reavers, Claws of Karnak, and Flesh Hounds units that are uh, wholly within 16 of the general. So now you can see the new Warcry units in here, which I guess is... A minor spoiler, but cool. Uh, Lord of the Gore Chosen, add one of the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Gore Chosen units while they're wholly within 16. And then High Priest of Corn, become a priest. Um, uh, in each of your hero phases, your general can chant, oh, sorry, priest only. In each of your hero phases, your uh, prayer can, or your priest can chant two prayers instead of one. And then Artifacts, you've got Demon Ones, there's four. Uh, Mark of the Blood Reaper, get a four plus um, ward against mortal wounds. Argath, the King of Blades, ward, uh, ward rolls cannot be made for enemy units while they're within eight, three of the bearer. Halo of Blood, strike first, and then Skull Shard Mantle. Add two to your Hatred of Sorcery, so you three plus ignore spells. And then Murderous Artifacts for Humans. Blood Rune at the end of the combat phase. If any wounds caused by an attack made by the bearer were allocated to a hero or monster not to get it, get a Blood Tithe point, so you can generate Blood Tithe just by wounding heroes and monsters. A Banner of Blood, Blood Secretor only. I forgot about how great that name is. You can reroll charge rolls for friendly blades of corn units wholly within 16. 
Um, a good tech one. Crimson played for a 5 plus ward. And then Gore Cleaver. Pick one of the bear's melee weapons, improve the run characteristic by one. In addition, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by the weapon is a six, the attack causes a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. And then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six prayers you can do. So Blood Sacrifice is the first one. Uh, you can chant it on a four and has a range of eight. If answered, uh, pick a friendly Blades of Core unit wholly within range, invisible. The unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, but you get a blood point. Bloodbind, it's a prayer that has a value of four, uh, sorry, three in a range of 16. If answered, pick an enemy unit within range visible to the Chanter and more than three from all friendly units. Your opponent must make a move up to eight inches with that unit. All of the models in that unit must finish a move as close as possible to the Chanter and can finish the move within three of units of your army. So you can pull guys into you as long as they're not already in combat. That one is incredibly valuable. Um, I think Bloodbind is a crazy ability. You just have to be, it's a, so it's a three plus chant on a 16. There's no dispelling it because it's a prayer. Um, and they make an eight inch move and can move into combat with you. Imagine how like horrifying that would be for like a big fat shooting unit or like you can break, um, you can just break units into combat with you that get charge bonuses and stuff like that. Really good. Bronzed Flesh, yeah, it's an old paint color, um, has a, uh, is a prayer with a value of three and a range of 16. If answered, pick a friendly Blades of Corn unit wholly within range invisible. Add one of the save rolls for attacks that target that unit until the start of your next phase. Killer Instinct, great video game. Um, <laughs> prayer value of three and a range of 16. If answered, pick a friendly Blades of Corn unit wholly within range and visible to the Chanter and more than three from the enemy and they can make a normal move. So you can make the enemy move towards you. You can also make yourself move with Killer Instinct. And then Unholy Flames has a prayer that um, has an answer value of four and a range of 16. If answered, pick a friendly Blades of Corn unit wholly within range and visible to the Chanter. And until the start of your next hero phase, the run goes up by one. And then Witchbane Curse. Uh, it is a prayer that has an answer value of four, and if answered, pick a front enemy wizard uh, that's visible. No range, just visible to the chanter. Uh, until the start of your next hero phase, subtract one from the cast rules made by that unit, and in addition, until the start of your next hero phase, each time that unit attempts to cast a spell, and that spell is not successfully cast, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. Yikes. Um, so, decidedly cool tech stuff in the prayers section, especially considering... There's really no stopping prayers. They just they just go off, um, and your priests can do a lot of things that you will be able to then shelter with. So like getting units into combat with you to shelter you from next round shooting, um, it effectively increases them. It, it effectively gives you an eight inch charge that isn't a charge, like a hard eight charge if you want to be in range. Um, now it's all hero phase, right? But it means that your opponent can't come within eight of you without like risking being charged basically and even worse you can kill her instinct to move somebody and then blood bind to bring them in too right so like you can one two if you've got the ability to do two prayers anyway i really like the player section i think it fits corn's followers and gives them a bunch of hero phase tech that feels really powerful considering how the army's going to be built all right so you get six slaughter host abilities the first one is the Reapers of Vengeance. They have Brutal Retribution. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Reapers of Vengeance demon units that target a hero. In addition, each time an enemy hero is slain, get an additional blood tithe point. You get your Blood Lords. Um, the first to draw blood when using the decapitating blow ability of a Blood Lord's Blood Letter unit, mortal wounds are caused an unmodified hit roll of five instead of six if they charge in the same turn. So building into Blood Letters. Um, again, building into Demons. So the first two, Reapers and Bloodlords, very demonic. And then finally the Baleful Lords, also demonic. Um, this Unbound Slaughter. Well, a friendly Baleful Lords Bloodthirster, other than Scarbrand, is holy with an aid of another friendly Baleful Lords Bloodthirster, other than Scarbrand. Use the top row of its damage table. So just have two set next to each other, and they're never wounded. Hooray. Although, the Bloodthirster gets more. He's like the Hulk. He gets more dangerous the more wounded <laughs> he gets. Uh, and then the Gortide, the mere mention of the Gortide is enough to strike fear into the heart of the most valiant warriors. So Tireless Conquerors add one of the wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly Gortide bloodbound units that target an enemy unit while it's contesting an objective that you do not control or that target an enemy unit that's wholly within enemy territory. So plus one to wound when they're not holding objective. Makes it real hard to take back from them. Um, and then Skullfiend Tribe. If you make an unmodified charge roll of 8 plus for a friendly Skullfiend Tribe bloodbound unit, strike first. Uh, and then the Flayed, friendly, the Flayed Bloodbound units have a ward save of 5+, plus if they've been picked to fight in the same phase. So if you go first, you have a 5-plus ward when you go afterwards. So picking guys is actually going to juice them up a little bit for the purpose of surviving afterwards. 
So I'm into it. I think that those are like, it's three and three demons and mortals uh, for picking your sort of poison there. Um, I like the uh, prayers a lot. I think these allegiance abilities are gonna be easy to navigate and they're all divided between, are you leaning into demons or leaning into mortals? So it's nice, simple, clean design. Like I said earlier, it's a streamlining of the book. Uh, Path to Glory stuff, it's all about skulls. You're gonna earn skulls and blood for corn. I mean, of course you are. <laughs> Uh, and that's how you're going to also earn your abilities. Your special abilities all do that, and all of your special places and territories are like blood temples and skull piles. And I mean, it's about as metalocalypse as you could possibly imagine, because that's that's corn is the most metal of factions. All right, let's get into some match play stuff and talk about your grand strategies. There are four. Um, the Blood Legion's March is the first one. When a battle ends, you complete this. Uh, grand strategy of every battle round after the first, you summon any Blades of Corn Demon units to the battlefield by spending Blood Tithe points. So you have to earn at least three Blood Tithe points every round and then summon them. So by turn two, you have to be getting three around. You have to be destroying three units per round. Or generating them some other way. So like you could start with the general, like you could build your army around accomplishing this. If you took the, if you took an ability, like if you took a Legion that gives you Blood Tithe points, and then your, your general starts the blood tithe point, and then you have that ability. Like, you, if you, the problem is that like, the things that earn you blood tithe points are kind of dictated by where, what your opponent has in their army too. So if you have to be fighting heroes or monsters to earn them with your special trait, that's not the best, that's not the best like, like strategy because they have to be on the, like your opponent has to bring you something for you to be able to earn it quickly. Otherwise you're just going to have to destroy all these units. So it feels like it could, be leaned into, but I don't think it's the low-hanging fruit in these ones. Uh, bring me a worthy skull at the start of the first battle round. Ask your opponent to pick a hero from your army to be the worthy foe. When the battle ends, you get this if they're dead, and the model you pick to be your general is not slain. So, ah, that feels nice and simple, like something you're trying to do anyway. Uh, reap the blood tithe, and it's not your general has to kill them either, it's just they have to be dead. Doesn't matter who kills them, and your general has to be alive. This feels like the most straightforward one, right? Uh, reap the blood tithe and the battle ends you complete this grand strategy of every battle round after the first you spend blood tithe points uh, To use a blood tithe reward and you did not use the same blood tithe reward more than once So if you can get to use one through four that feels a little more doable because like You have to earn 12 blood tithe points to accomplish The blood legions march by summoning at least one corn demon unit every turn Reap the blood tithe you have to do one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is 10. So it's two less blood tithe points to be able to use the top four rewards once per game. A little more doable, and you could lean into it the same way. And then Disciples of Carnage, when the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy if you completed at least four battle tactics, and every battle tactic you completed is from the top, the, for the uh, Skull Throne one. So this seems to be pretty common in the Battle Tomes now. They say if you do your Battle Tome ones, at least four of them, then you get this grand strategy. I'm not a huge, like I'm not the hugest fan of these um, because some of the bespoke battle tactics in the Battle Tomes are not that easy. I feel like Bring Me a Worthy Skull is the most straightforward here. And it's probably the one I would do because you don't get to repick like it, in, if you're going to a tournament or something like that, you don't get to change it. So there's always going to be an enemy here on the other side of the table. And I'm always going to be trying to kill them. And I'm always going to be trying to keep my general alive. So it, it's nothing I'm not doing anyway playing a game of Warhammer. And I can get three points if I succeed at the end of the game. All right, for the Skull Throne, your battle tactics. Blood for the altar. Pick an enemy unit within eight of your Skull Altar. You complete this battle tactic if the enemy it's destroyed. So just, just don't want it in the Skull Actor. You can't get that one. Now, uh, slay the sorcerer, pick an enemy wizard hero on the battlefield, complete this tactic if they're dead. Again, your opponent has to have one of those, so playing Caradron, you just can't do this one. Um, the Trials of the Skulls, pick a friendly unit. You complete this battle tactic if eight or more uh, enemy models are slain by attacks made by an, uh, that unit during this turn. That one feels like low hanging fruit. You're gonna, f I mean, again, you gotta fight something with one wound. So you gotta fight goblins, you gotta fight Skaven, like. Again, Trial of Skulls, it, they're opportunistic, these ones. Actually, the first three are all kind of opportunistic. Um, no Cowards Among Us. Complete this battle tactic at the end of the turn if all friendly Blades of Corn units in your battlefield are within eight of enemy units. So that one's, that one's feels doable regardless of mission because everything you have fights in melee, so you're gonna have to do this anyway. Um, but your priests would have to leave their altar. 
Yeah. Again, there's a there's a thing there. If your priest is on, if you're using your free train piece and you have a priest standing on it, then someone's gonna have to have walked over to that altar for you to be able to get this one. Uh, leave none standing. Pick a friendly unit within three of any enemy units. You complete this tactic if that unit fights in the combat phase of this turn, and at the end of the phase, there are no enemy units within three of it. So you have to have killed everybody around you. And the battlefield runs red. You complete this battle tactic if four more enemy units were destroyed during this turn. Or sorry, four more units, period, not, not enemy units. So if anybody dies, corn's happy, hooray. Um, this feels like a like this feels like a list of battle tactics that either you're gonna get them all because everything aligns right for you during a game, or you're gonna get none of them because your opponent didn't bring you stuff to work with, or didn't or or knew what they were and didn't go stand next to your blood your throne or your um, your units or didn't come near your um, your skull altar. Like, you could very easily get locked out of these, either early on, because you didn't pick the right tactic on the right turn and something happened, you can't go back, um, or your opponent's army just doesn't give you access to fighting a wizard, for instance. So like, yeah, I don't love these. I don't, I don't think this is a great list. I think this list is pretty, like I said, opportunistic. Um, and I think they could happen really easily all at once, or they could happen not at all because your opponents, like in Trial of Skulls, you're never gonna get fighting ogres if they don't bring Noblars, you know, like, or, or even orcs, like even like Iron Jaws, you're not gonna get that one probably because they're all lots of wounds. It's hard to kill eight models, not wounds worth of models. It's eight or more enemy models that are slain by attacks made by that single unit during that turn. Um, yeah, I don't love this. I don't love this list of battle tactics. I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a very situationally dependent list and it's going to be hard to pull them off, uh, which then also freezes out Disciples of Carnage. So yeah, use the ones from the battle pack and then bring me over the skull. <laughs> I think is the, is the way here. <laughs> uh, core battalion, you get a gore chosen battalion, uh, and that is just gore chosen units. So take five gore chosen units in your army. Uh, a Gore Chosen unit is just anybody with the Gore Chosen keyword. <laughs> uh, so you get Unified, so up to f you have to have a minimum of five Gore Chosen units. They give you Unified and they also give you Magnificent. So single drop Magnificent if you have five Gore Chosen units. Uh, and they just have the Gore Chosen keyword. And Gore Chosen I believe is just the, all the mortal stuff basically. All right, let's get into some War Scrolls. Scarbrand, uh, let's pull up my app. Go check out some references and see Scarbrand. What do you got going on, buddy? What's new? Uh, you got two extra wounds. That's pretty cool. Uh, you got your Roar of Total Rage. Does it work the same? Uh, roll number dice equal to your... Okay, so you used to be picking... Any, so you Roar of Total Rage. You're not using attacks against for attacks made by this. Instead, pick an enemy unit within range of the attack and roll number of dice uh, equal to the damage table for every four plus take him on a wound. So it, they've condensed his his wound table now. It starts at zero to six. It's two dice, and then seven to nine, 10 to 12, 13 plus. It'll go two, three, four, five. Uh, slaughter is five, six, seven, eight for his one axe. That's his attack value. And then Carnage is the, I think, it just mortal wound. Yeah, <laughs> so Carnage starts on a four plus, take eight mortal wounds, <laughs> and then it ends up being one plus once he's taken 13 wounds. <laughs> he just does eight mortal wounds too. Um, yeah, so he's pretty much the same. The Roar of Total Rage is still um, roll number of dice on every four plus, take a mortal wound. Uh, Scarbrand's Rage, it's sort of the f each battle round after the first, unless the unit is just language changing, it sounds like. Uh, when this unit's enraged, use the uh, bottom row of its damage table, regardless of how many wounds are allocated to it. Yeah, so basically, at the start of each battle round, after the first, unless this unit fought in, in both combat phases in the previous battle round, it becomes enraged until the end of the battle. So he has to be in combat all the time. Um, while this unit's enraged, use the bottom row of its damage table, regardless of how many wounds are allocated to it. So it's always like, like basically, if he doesn't fight twice in a row, um, no matter how many wounds he has left, you want to try and keep him out of combat, basically, so that you can get to five roars, uh, eight attacks with slaughter, and a one plus carnage. And then inescapable wrath, you can charge from 18 inches away instead of 12 and roll 3d6 when making charge rolls for this unit. So you're just going to try and always be in range. Because he walks eight because his wings are all torn off. 
And that seems, so it's reroll charge roll, so inescapable wrath basically turned into a 3d6 charge. And that seems like the, the core change. It's his wound values, uh, his actual weapons. Uh, slaughter is way better. It's twos and twos, uh, minus two, three damage. So it went from fours and threes to twos and twos with a two inch range. So he hits way harder, way more often um, for a ton of damage and potentially just like explodes at mortal wounds as well. So big glow up for our boy. He was 390 points. We'll see where he's sitting now because 390 points is a, uh, a relative... I mean, he seemed kind of expensive for what he was before. How are we, how are we looking now, Scarbrand? You're looking at... That's Scar Bloodwrath. How many people are named Scar? 380. He went down 10 points. Oh, my God. Down 10 points, and the Bloodthirsters are 330. All of them. All of them are 330. Well, let's talk about Bloodthirsters then and see how these guys are. Uh, all right, so different flavors of Bloodthirster. Let's start with the uh, War Scroll, the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster. Because that guy's where it's at. He also gained two wounds. Uh, his Hellfire Breath and Blood Flail. Uh, Blood Flail went down to eight inches of range. It's still threes and threes with one attack, but its damage is starting at, yeah, it stays at six. Lowest is three now. Never gets to D3. And then his Mighty X Corn, eight attacks, two plus, minus two D3 damage. So he's gained two attacks there. And his wound profile is also condensed. So it's six, uh, seven, and nine, 10 and 12, and then 13 plus. And his move is 12, 11, 10, nine. Blood Flail drops to three. Mighty X Corn's wound value goes two plus, three plus, four plus. He flies. Uh, Commander of Tyrants, in the combat phase, when you pick this unit to fight for the first time, you can pick a friendly Bloodthirster of Incarnate Rage or Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury wholly within 16 of this unit that's not yet fought, and they can fight one after the other. So the leader Bloodthirster basically can chain activate your other Bloodthirsters. <laughs> oh my god. And then it's Hellfire Breath. Uh, the attack characters that give us equal to the number of models in the target unit, up to 10. And Marshall of Corn, once returned this unit, can issue a command without a command point being spent. That's nice. So he's lost his Rune Crown of Corn because you've got that as a Blood Tithe ability basically now. Uh, he lost Lord of the Blood Hunt, but gained Commander of Tyrants. Lost Relentless Hunter. So he's a bit fightier, generally a bit more expensive, 20 points more expensive, um, but a bit more consistent. And the free command point's nice because it means it gets around Luminous Shenanigans of increasing the value of command abilities and being able to chain activate Blood is just pretty powerful. So let's talk about those guys. The Insensate Range. Bloodthirster of Insensate Rage. Uh, also gained two wounds. They're all at 16. Thank God they got on the program of uh, multiples of eight. Um, so his damage on his Great X Corn went to D3 plus three as opposed to D6. So four to six mortal wo or wounds now is way more consistent. Damage table condensed the exact same way. So 0 to 6, 7 to 9, 10 to 12, 13 plus. Moves 12 to 9. Uh, at the bottom, Great X Corn's 5, 5, 4, 3. And then his Outrageous Charge is his only special rule. All of his other special rules are gone, just the Outrageous Charge. Uh, if the unmodified wound roll for a uh, attack made with the Great X Corn is a 6, the attack causes the number of mortal wounds equal to to each enemy unit with an eight equal to the outrageous carnage value. So it starts at four, goes to three, goes to two, goes to one. In addition to any damage they would normally take. So he's still a big hammer kashlammer, 330 points, he's a big damage dealer. And then the Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury, also gained two wounds. His Lash of Corn is exactly the same, but its range went to eight instead of 12. Mighty Axe Corn. Uh, is two extra attacks. Eight attacks now, hits on twos instead of threes, wounds on twos at the beginning, goes to worst fours at the bottom of the brackets. And then his Lash of Corn um, is four attacks at the start and then goes to two at the bottom. Goes four, four, three, two on his brackets. He flies, he can beckon the heart at the start of the charge phase. You can pick a friendly Blades of Corn unit. Um, wholly within 16 inches of this unit that's not a hero until the end of the phase. That unit can attempt to charge if it's within 18 of an enemy instead of 12, and it can roll 3d6 instead of 2d6. That's cool. You can push out a 3d6 charge. And the Land Rebels. Subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made by enemy units. 
while they're within eight inches of any friendly units with this ability. In addition, at the end of the combat phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit with an eight on a four plus dig D3 mortal wounds because he shapes the world around him. Cool. So for 990 points, you get three bloodthirsters. Uh, you pick which one you want to chain fight with and you just launch them into everything. I'm into that. I think that's a cool army. 990 points of that and then another thousand points of whatever I feel like taking that's battle line. Um, they're not gore chosen, so just take 500 points or 1,000 points of gore chosen, have them single drop and have four drops. I guess once you're over one drop, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of irrelevant, but that's pretty, that's pretty rad. All right, we're on a skull taker. We're talking special characters now. Uh, he is the super blood or blood letter. Uh, he gained two wounds, so he's got seven instead of five now. His Super Slayer Sword has two extra attacks now, so and it's a two-inch range. So uh, two-inch range, five attacks, twos and threes, minus one, two damage. Four plus ward for his cloak. Slayer Sword. <laughs> it's the Slayer Sword, the one you paint for. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with the Slayer Sword is a six, that attack causes two mortal wounds to the target, and the attack sequence ends. Um, if an attack um, targets an enemy hero, the attack causes three mortal wounds instead. Here is Bane, the start of the combat phase. You can say that Skull Tigger is issuing a challenge, and if you do so, pick an enemy hero within three. Until the end of the phase, the strike first effect applies to this unit, but all of its attacks must target that hero. And then Skulls for the Skull Throne. If the uh, unit is included in a Blades of Corn army, each time an enemy hero is slain by a model, or by attack made by this model, you get an additional blood tithe point. So basically, he can earn you blood tithe points, which is nice. So he lost his decapitating strike, but gained the Slayer Sword, which is not quite the same thing. It dropped the Mortal Wounds and it's mostly against heroes now. And it's not in addition to normal damage, it's the attack sequence ends, which is a significant reduction, but his, but his rate of doing it's gonna go up because he has two extra attacks, right? So like, the, the, um, his potential damage is lower, but his practical damage is probably more consistent because you're rolling five dice fishing for a six instead. All right, Karanak, where you at? You got a whole cult that worships you now, so you better be cool. You got you got the hounds of whatever. Uh, I don't see Karanak in here. Why well, don't I see Karanak? Mighty Lord of Corn, Scala, and Fagrim. Uh, Valkyrie Brother. Oh, he's just not in here. Herald of Corn, Exalted Deathbringer, Drom, Bloodthirsters. Why don't I see Karanak in this unit? Was he an other unit? Is he even like, oh no, he's an other, he's not a hero, that's why. I was like, what? Is he a hero now? Yeah, he's a hero now, okay. Was he not a hero before? Weird. No, he was a hero before. I don't know why he wasn't in the hero section, that's super weird. Um, what's he got going on? Two extra wounds, just like Skeltigger got. Uh, he has the same gore slick jaws attacks. Three savage maws are the same as well. Mm, he can unbind a spell. He's plus two to charge. If he includes a, in a Blades of Corn army, includes friendly summoned corn hound or flesh hound units, they can be set up within nine of him as long as they're set up play within eight of this unit. They can sorry, be set up within nine of the enemy as long as they're set next to him because he's the hunt master. And then pray of the Blood God after deployment before the first battle round, uh, pick an enemy here to be their prey. At the end of the movement phase, if he has more than nine from all enemy units, it can make a normal move. So basically, at the end of the enemy moon phase, this guy can move towards you. It must be closer to the prey than it um, started. And then flesh hounds themselves. They're in here, right? <laughs> Why am I not able to find things? Probably because it was other units. Oh, these guys are battle line. Uh, flesh hounds, eight inch move, same core stats. Burning roar, exactly the same. Uh, blood dark claws, exactly the same. Color cone that can unbind. One every five can be a gore hound. Plus two charge. Yeah. It's not reroll now, it's plus two to charge, which is probably actually better. Having a flat bonus. Uh, and then your Bloodmaster Herald of Corn. What do you got going on, Bloodmaster? You've got an extra wound to six instead of seven. Mm, same attack profile. Uh, rolled a hit of six is two mortal wounds, the attack sequence ends, and that's, uh, it's a, it's better because it's two mortal wounds instead it used to be one. So your mortal wound top has gone up, but you're ending the attack sequence. 
Blood must flow. In the combat phase, you can pick a unit to fight. Uh, when you pick this unit to fight for the first time, pick a friendly blood letters unit, holy with an eight, and they can fight afterwards. And then blood mark, it's a prayer, because he's a priest with a value of three and a range of 16. If answered, pick an enemy unit within range invisible. Until the start of your next hero phase, add one to wound rolls for attacks made by friendly blades of corn demon units that target that enemy unit. That's great because it's a blanket plus one to wound rolls for everybody who attacks the same unit. So you pick their big Death Star unit and just go ham. All right, blood letters. This guy's best friends forever. What do they got? Anything new? Uh, they all got an extra wound. That's a huge deal. So twice as many wounds on their profile. Uh, two wounds, five plus save. Uh, they got a... Oh, geez. Uh, the older Blades of Corn Demon units, so they get a 5 plus ward now to get into combat as well. Uh, two inch range on their weapons instead of one. That's sweet. Threes and threes instead of fours and threes. Two attacks each. These guys just went way up. They were 110 points for 10. Now, come on, cheaper. They are 180 points. So, I there had to be some kind of increase because otherwise, like, I mean, that's you've doubled their wound count and their attack output, so... I mean, I don't feel bad, <laughs> but wow. Uh, Hellblades are a mortal wound. Uh, musician is plus one to charge roll. Standard bearer is. Um, if the unmodified Battleshock rolls a one, you can return a slain model. And that's it. Yeah, they do one mortal wound when they hit on a six. The Skull Master, Herald of Corn. Uh, there's so many, so many names for these guys. You got. A better save and a better wound. So you got a mounted bonus and a better wound. So seven wounds, three plus save. His blade of blood is two inch range now instead of one. Four attacks, three plus, three plus, minus one, two damage. He gained damage as well. Brazen Hoove stayed the same. Decapitating Blow, so he does two mortal wounds if he hits on a six. A slaughterous Charge, uh, two plus does three mortal wounds to enemy within three. And then Herald of the Blood Thunder Stampede. Once per battle, at the start of the charge phase, you can declare that the Skull Master will declare a Bloodthirsty Stampede. Sorry, a Blood Thunder Stampede. If you do so until the end of the charge phase, reroll charge rolls for this unit and friendly Blood Crushers unit, wholly within 16. And then your Blood Crushers. I like that everybody got more wounds to get them into combat. Uh, blood Crushers are an other unit I'm betting. They sure are. They gained a wound and a save, so three plus save, four wounds each, because they are giant metal robot stampeders. Uh, two inch range in their Hellblade as well. Two attacks, three plus, three plus, minus one, one damage. Brazen Hooves are the same. Uh, musicians plus one charge. Standard Bearer is bringing a guy back on a one. Decapitating Blows, mortal wounds on a six. One mortal wounds, and then Murderous Charge. Uh, pick an enemy unit within three at the end of the charge roll. And roll dice for each model in this unit. Two to four, they take a mortal wound. Five plus, take two mortal wounds. Because so they crash in. All right, we're into the weird stuff now. The Blood Throne and the Skull Cannon. Oh, Blood Throne and Skull Cannon. I love, I love this, like, 1980s style units. They make me so happy. Uh, the Blood Throne's a hero. He gained three wounds, but not a save, weirdly. I thought he would, because he was mounted. So he's only got... He has seven originally. He's got ten now and a four plus save. His blade of blood's got a two inch reach now too. Also the increase to hit and damage. Uh, same decapitating blow. Does a mortal wounds equal to its damage characteristic though? But always the attack sequence ends. Gore feast. Each time model slain by this unit, you can heal a uh, wound allocated to this unit. And then blood call. Prayers on three um, and is sixteen inch range. Add one of the chanting rolls. Uh, if the Chanter is within three of any enemy units, if answered, pick a friendly blood letter host unit and a friendly blood crushers unit, or a friendly blood crushers unit, wholly within range invisible. If the unit's blood letters, you can return D6 slain models. If it's blood crusher, you can uh, bring back one. So he's a healing aura. That's pretty cool. And that is a big change priest-wise to him. Uh, and then the cool the skull cannon. Everybody loves a skull cannon. <laughs> I love how weird some stuff gets. Um, Skull Cannon, he gained a wound, just like the, the other unit, so he's got eight instead of seven now. Burning Skulls are worse to hit, fours to hit, minus two D3 damage, with four attacks instead of one, though, now. So that'll even out. So one attack, threes and threes, or four attacks, um, 
uh, threes and threes, sorry. It's not worse to hit, it's exactly the same. I was looking at the attack value, not the hit value. So it just got three extra attacks. Uh, and then Hellblades are two inch reach like before. Same as the Blood Letter Hellblade. Gnashing Maw is the same as previous. Uh, grind their bones and seize their skulls in the combat phase after this unit's fought for the first time. In that phase, if any enemy units were slain by this unit, um, this unit can automatically shoot. So it just shoots if it kills somebody because it loads their heads into the gun and fires them in immediately. I love that. Uh, and then decapitating blows the sixes for mortal wounds. All right, we're into the mortal stuff. Corgos Cool, the man with the coolest face mask. And one of the oldest Age of Sigmar miniatures now. Isn't it weird to say that? He's an old Age of Sigmar miniature because he came in the original two-player starter set. He's what, he is the oldest Corn Bloodbound series of models. He gained a wound, which is nice. Um, so went to seven wounds. His Axe Corn gained three attacks. Uh, threes and threes minus two, flat two damage. And then the dark, uh, Blood Dark Claws are the same. Uh, Axe's Bane. He can fight if he's in, with an eight instead of three and piles in an extra three or five when he does. So he piles in eight and he fights with an eight so he doesn't have to charge you. Uh, Cholera Corn can unbind his reality splitting axe. Each time this unit fights, wounds caused by its blood uh, dark claws must be allocated before wounds caused by its axe of corn. At the end of the phase, if any wounds caused by the unit's axe of corn were allocated to enemy unit and the enemy unit's not been slain, roll a die and a five plus is just slain. You just die because that axe turns you inside out. And then Lord of the Gore Tide. If this unit's included in a Gore Tide army, once for battle at the start of the combat phase, you can say that Cool will be unleashed the Wrath of the Gore Tide. If you do so until the end of the phase, you time a friendly Gortide blood bounty at slain, you can make an additional murder roll. So murder twice instead of once. Cool. All right, our new mini, the Realm Gore Ritualist. She's ready to say prayers to Korn. Uh, five wounds, five plus save, and a five inch move. Got a ritual dagger. Uh, it's one attack, threes and threes, minus two D6 damage. She does the Kali Ma Indiana Jones thing and pulls your heart out. And then she's got Desecrating Blood Runes. Once per battle at the end of your movement phase, you can pick one objective or terrain feature within three of this unit and say that it has been marked for Desecrating with Blood Runes. If you do so until the end of the battle, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly blood uh, bound units that are within eight inches of that objective or terrain feature. And then a Blood Hacks. It's a prayer that has an answer value of four and a range of 16. If answered, pick one enemy unit within range invisible to the character, uh, the chanter, sorry. And to the start of your next hero phase, extract one from the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapon, so a minimum of one. And then she's a priest, so she'll know an additional spell, or prayer rather, on top of that. That's cool. I like the fact that she can create areas of conflict, um, and she's relatively cheap, and give you that, uh, that plus one hit. So, like, it's, a f it's basically an aura spot on the battlefield for, like, the most highly contested objective, where everyone's all, all attacking all the time. I think that's fantastic. All right, Lord of Corn on a Juggernaut. How's this guy doing? He also gained a wound, and he has a two plus save. I like it. Um, he had a three plus previously. Oh no, he didn't gain a wound. Sorry, he just gained a save. He had eight. He had. I thought he had seven wounds before. He's got eight wounds. Um, yeah, dude's got three extra attacks though with his Wrath Forge Jacks. Threes and threes minus one two damage, and then Brazen Hooves are three attacks. Threes and threes one damage. He's got a two plus. Does three mortal wounds when he charges. Um, five plus uh, ward save against spells and mortal wounds caused by uh, abilities of endless spells. And then Lord of the Brass Stampede. Once for battle at the start of the charge phase, you can say this unit will declare a Brass Stampede. And if you do so, um, you can reroll charge rolls for this unit and any mighty skull crusher units within 16, which is the mortal skull crushers. Scar Blood Wrath. This is the dude who's like half turned into a demon. Uh, a relatively weird special character. Is he awesome though? Does it does it blend? He's got an extra wound now for six wounds instead of five. That's sweet. Uh, his Bloodstorm Blades are still equal to either five or the number of models within uh, three inches, which is whichever one's higher. Two attacks, threes and threes, minus one, one damage. So he's still not damaged two. At the end of the movement phase, he hits on twos though. Which, I mean, he's gonna hit a lot, but it's only one damage. At the end of the moon phase, if this unit's uh, been destroyed on a 2d6 roll of 8+, plus, you can set this unit up anywhere in the battlefield more than none from the enemy. He just comes back. And then Murderous Paragon, if this unit's included in a Blades of Corn army, you can make an additional murder roll for each model from a friendly Wrathmonger's unit with an 8 until it's slain. He shows, uh, he shows how it's done, and those guys do double the number of um, 
bloody murder rolls. Valkia the Mighty, uh, so she's got six wounds instead of five now, and that's her big glow up. Uh, she actually lost an attack on Slopnir and gained a damage. So she's five attacks instead of six, but it's damage two, which is nice. She's got the Red Angel of Slaughter during deployment before setting up the scene in the battlefield. You can set the scene to side and say it's in the skies. Uh, shows up more than nine from the enemy. Then you can pick an enemy with, it with ten and roll a die. And a, one of the things happens in a two plus. They take a number of mortal wounds equal to the roll. So basically set up next to them, roll a six, and they take six mortal wounds. She got a five plus ward and the gaze of corn. Add three to the bravery characteristic of units other than friendly bloodbound uh, while they're wholly within 16 of this unit. Sorry, of friendly bloodbound. So the bloodbound are all plus two leadership. Add three to their bravery. Uh, however, friendly bloodbound units cannot retreat while they're within 16 of her. So they all freak out and become super, super, super brave, but they won't run away. Uh, the not version of uh, Korgo Cool, the Mighty Lord of Corn. he's got seven wounds, three plus save, Axe of Korn's the same, five attacks, reason three is minus two, two damage, Caller lets him dispel, and then his command ability is bring me their skull. Uh, you can use his command ability at the start of the command phase, or combat phase. This unit must issue the command and the unit to receive it must be a friendly Gore Chosen unit, and the Strike First ability applies. All right, the Blood Secrator with his giant banner. How did you do, Blood Secrator? We are getting into some old miniatures now. It's funny looking at them. I, I've, I haven't seen some of these miniatures in so long. And I have a painted Blood Secrator. He's got the coolest, the coolest ponytail because it's made from spines. He gained a wound. Uh, he gained a damage. He's damaged two. He's got Rage of Corn. Once you're about at the start of the combat phase, pick a friendly unit in the battlefield with this ability and plant the icon of corn. If you do so, add one of the attacks characteristic of melee weapons made by friendly uh, Blades of Corn units on the battlefield until the end of the phase. So just anywhere in the battlefield, if he plants the banner, then that's it. Uh, icon of the Blood God. Uh, if, this issue, if this unit issues the Rally Command to a friendly Blood Band unit with a wound characteristic of three or less, you can return a slain model on a four plus instead of a six. Ooh, boy. Yeah, I'll take that. Blood Warrior's coming back. Holy moly. That's a cool ability. And that doesn't require it to plant the flag either. So once you're battle, he can give you plus one attack, or he can just give you, like, tons of rallies. That's a great ability. Uh, and then Slaughter Priests. There are various kinds. Uh, they can be armed with either a Hackblade and Wrath Hammer or a Bloodbathed Axe. And they wear their weird, like, horns over their shoulders. Uh, they gained no... Oh! They lost a movement. They went to movement five for movement six. Weird. So they're slower. Uh, they gained a two rend on their uh, attacks and a three to hit. So Bloodbathed Axe is threes and threes, two, uh, minus two, two damage. The Hackblade and Wrath Hammer is five attacks, threes and fours, minus one, two damage. So more attacks, but less of a wound rate. They can unbind and then Blood Boil. It's a prayer that has a value of four and a range of 16. If answered, pick an enemy unit within range invisible, and they take D6 mortal wounds. No big deal, just D6 mortal wounds. Skull Grinder with his big flail anvil thing. There are so many characters in this unit, in this army. He gained a wound. Uh, he's got a worse to wound. So he's threes and threes, three attacks, two inch range, minus one, three damage. So he used to be twos to wound, now he's only threes to wound. He's got Bone Crushing Strikes. Add one of the damage characteristic of a scene's Brazen Anvil attacks, the target enemy monster. In addition, if any wounds caused by an attack made with this weapon are allocated to an enemy monster, the strike last effect applies to the enemy monster until the end of the phase. And then Tempered with Fury. Um, at the end of the deployment, you can pick one other friendly Bloodbound hero within eight of this unit uh, to have their weapons tempered. If you do so, pick one of the hero's melee weapons, improve its run by one until the end of the battle. And you can't do it to the same unit more than once. So he just ups your rend for free. Just start sharpening your axe. All right. My two favorite ones. I have all of these painted from playing Gore Chosen. Um, I should do something with this. I have a huge corn army, actually. Uh, this is the Aspiring Deathbringer. And he's the one with two weapons. So he gained a wound, a six, and a three plus save instead of a four plus save. Two extra attacks. Threes and threes minus one, two damage. So you got way stabbier. Uh, there is no Wrath Hammer one, though. There's only one flavor of Aspiring Champion now. There's just the one swinging the two blades, it looks like. 
And then he's got Favor Through Triumph. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack move, this uh, unit's a six and the target's a hero. It does immortal wounds in addition to any extra damage. So this guy keeps his in addition damage. And then the Exalted Deathbringer, the one without a spear, because apparently the spear one is now gone and the big, like, cru impale guy crucifixion while the impaler thing is over. Uh, he has the claw, a runous axe, and skull gadger, or an impaling spear, so you can do both. That one you can do both with. The Aspiring Deathbringer is just Gorax and Skull Hammer. There's no different one. Mm, he gained a wound, and he lost a save. He's got a 5-plus save now because he took his shirt off. Exalted Deathbringer. Um, he's got 4 attacks instead of 3. 3 and 4 is minus 1, 2 damage. 3 damage for his Runous Axe and Skull Gadger. His Impaling Spear is 5 attacks instead of 6. Um, no, it's, it is 5 attacks, sorry. The Blood Bite Axe is gone. That's why. Uh, impaling Spear is 3 and 3 is minus 2, 2 damage though. But he's got a 5 plus ward, so the shirtlessness is a little less of a big deal. The Skull Gouger, if the unmodified save roll for an attack made by a melee weapon that targets a unit armed with the Ruinous Axe and Skull Gouger is a 6. The attacking unit suffers D3 mortal wounds after all of its attacks are resolved. And then first of the Gore Chosen, add one of the hit rolls for attacks made by this unit while it's wholly within 8 inches of any other friendly bloodbound unit that's a general. Because he hangs with the general. All right, let's get into actual units. Blood Reavers, the mainstay. Uh, they got no course out improvements. Uh, just the blood letters did. Their reaver axes are threes and fours now. So two attacks, threes and fours, uh, one damage. And the meat ripper axe is two attacks, fours and fours, minus one, one damage. Uh, plus one attack for the champion. Standard gets plus one bravery. And musician gives you plus one charge. Frenzy devotion. Add one to wound rolls for attacks made by uh, melee weapons by this unit. If they're wholly within 16 of any corn totem. So the blood scrater will give you extra bonuses. And then wrathmongers. How did you guys do? You're in the other section yet again. Uh, gain to bravery to bravery eight. Their wrath flails. Uh, got threes to hit. Minus one, one damage, they went up to hit. Crimson Phase, add one of their attack characteristic uh, of melee weapons made by Friendly Blades of Corn if they're an eight of the, anyone with his ability, but it doesn't affect them. And then Blood Fury, if they have modified hit roll for an attack made by a melee weapon that targets this unit as a one, they take a mortal wound, because these guys are just flailing around like crazy. All right, Blood Warriors, the Stormcast, if you will, of uh, this army, because they're basically Stormcast Eternals. They gained a 3 plus save. So 5 inch, 2 move, two wounds, 3 plus save. Sick. Uh, the paired Gorax and Gore Fist is 2 attacks, 3s and 4s, minus 1, 1 damage, but they get the parry. Um, the Gore Fist, if um, the unmodified save for an attack that targets this uh, unit, or melee attack targets this unit to 6, they take a mortal wound, the bounce back. And then paired Gore Axes is 3 attacks, 3s and 4s, minus 1, 1 damage. And the Gore Glaive is 2 attacks, 3s and 3s, minus 2, 2 damage. And then no respite. Uh, if this corn unit includes a Blades of Corn Army, is included in a Blades of uh, Corn Army, when they die, they take two murder rolls instead of one. So they go down hard. And then the Blood Stoker. This guy, I love his like weird stabber arm. <laughs> Where like he's lost a chunk of his hand, so they, they've impaled like a piece of stabber to him. Um, he's got. No core stat changes. His torture blade is minus one run and two damage now. And his blood whip is three inch range, exactly the same. And then whip to fear at the start of the movement phase, you can pick D3 other friendly blood bound units within three of this unit and roll a dice for each of them. Regardless of the roll, the unit can run and charge later in the turn, but on a one, they take a mortal wound. And then mighty skull crushers, your super ultra heavy cavalry. And they're another unit as well. They have a two plus save now. <laughs> what? Five wounds, two plus save. Uh, their core attacks are four attacks, three plus, three plus, minus one, one damage. For the axe, the blood glaive is two inch range. Uh, four attacks, fours and threes, minus two, one damage. And the brazen hooves are three attacks, threes and threes, one damage. What? Two plus save and sorcerer axe guys are legit. That is a nice stat line. Um, champions plus one attack, standard bear gets plus one bravery, musician one in every three models can be a horn blower, plus one to run, rolls to charge, run an end charge. 
And a 5 plus mortal wound save um, for uh, spells and spells and murderous charge. Um, uh, 2 to 4 take a mortal wound if you're within range of them for every enemy unit within 3, or for every unit within 3. And 5 they take 2 mortal wounds. So if you charge 3 of them in, you roll 3d6. On a 1, nothing happens. For every 2 to 4, it's 1 mortal wound. 5, it's 2. And then Skull Reapers, last of the big 40 mil infantry. They gain a bravery to 8. That's cool. Um, their core stats, they got a 2 inch range and their demon forged weapons now. Uh, four attacks, threes and threes, minus one, one damage, and the Vicious Mutation for the champions. Uh, one attack, threes and threes, minus two, d3 damage. Um, hits of six are Mortal Wound, addition to normal damage, and then Reap a Deadly Toll. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit if they target has five or more models. So the bigger the unit they charge into, uh, they get plus one hit, hit on twos. And then the Claws of Karnak, your new cult unit from Warcry. Uh, you're going to get eight models, and one of them must be a pack lord. They get plus two to their attack characteristic. Their weapons of the hunt are two inch range, uh, two attacks, fours and fours, minus one, one damage. They got six inch move, one wound, five plus save, and bravery five. The gouge claws on the, um, like the, the one that thinks it's a, uh, the one that thinks it's a bloodhound, or blood, yeah, blood, blood, yeah, bloodhound, is, uh, not bloodhound, a um, corn flesh hound, is four attacks, threes and threes, minus two, one damage. And they get sent to blood after deployment, but before the first battle run, they can make a normal move. And pack hunters add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit if they're within eight of any friendly flesh hound units, because they worship them. They think they want to be the goodest boys. All right, other monster stuff. Skyla Anfagrim, one of the oldest named baddies in all of Warhammer. And I love that he's still around. I have the original Skyla Anfagrim. It looks like the three toed Chaos Sloth. <laughs> that uh, Trish Morrison sculpted. It's a great miniature. Uh, eight inch move, eight wounds, course that's the same. Uh, he's got flat eight attacks now instead of two d6. Fours and threes minus one, one damage. Serpentine tail, two attacks, threes and threes minus one d3 damage. And then he's got his brass collar so he can dispel and beast your leap. He can fight with an eight and he piles in an eight instead of three. Sweet. Still good, a little more, a little more reliable. Uh, the Korgorath. Mm, he's in here, right? I'm sure he is. He's not here, though. So he's in the other section. I'm like, I have to scroll like up and down all the way through again. Uh, he is identical core stat wise. His attacks are identical for his bone tentacles. Uh, his claws and fangs are five attacks, three and threes, minus one, two damage. He's the same. Perfect predator. Can't use inspiring presence within three of them. Take her heads. Each time an enemy model is slain by attacks made of this model, they heal. And violent monstrosity of this uh, unit is included in the Blades of Corn army. When it's destroyed, you can make five murder rolls instead of one. Because he's a violently monstrosity monster. And the Gore Chosen and Drama are the same as currently on the website. They haven't changed. Same with Makor's Fiends. I did not notice any changes for them either. Or Garrick's Reavers. Because these are now legacy Underworlds units. All right, let's take a look at our invocations. The Hex Gorger Skull. Two skies, raining blood from a lacerated sky. This invocation has two parts. <laughs> um, you summon on a prayer answer value of three in a range of eight inches, so that I'm pulling within range. Uh, and within eight of each other. And then, compelled by hate, after this invocation is set up by the start of each of the hero's phases, the commanding player can move the parts of the invocation as if they were models with a move value of 8 and they could fly. After the parts have been moved, they must be within 8 of each other. And then, Hex Gorgers, you're minus 2 to cast rolls for wizards with an 8 of it. In addition, wizards with an 8 of the invocation uh, that attempts to cast the spell, and the unmodified cast roll is 8, then the casting attempt is not successful. The wizard can no longer knows that spell, and each wizard with an 8 of the invocation suffers d6 mortal wounds, and they're removed from play. So don't roll an 8. <laughs> uh, the bleeding icon, it's a summon on a 3 and set up with an 8. Drifting Menace, after this invocation is set up, you can move it 8 inches as if it could fly, and then Sigil of Doom. Units cannot receive the Inspiring Presence command within 8 of it. In addition, the unit fails a battle shock test within 8 of it. On a 1 to 5, add D3 to the number of models that flee. On a 6, add D6, and then remove this from play. It has no ability, uh, no um, effect on corn units. 
and then the Wrath Axe. It's flung with fury. At the start of this invocation, once it's set up, the commanding player can move this invocation as a former model with a move character if it can fly. And then Hatred's Edge, sorry, it casts on a four, it has a range of eight to set it up. Hatred's Edge, after this invocation has moved, roll a d6 for each enemy, or each unit that has any models it uh, passed across. So when you set it up, it moves immediately, and then it moves in each hero phase. On a two plus, take d3 mortal wounds. Then the commanding player can pick a unit within three of the invocation, roll another dice. On a one, nothing happens. On a two to five, they take d3 mortal wounds. On a six, they take d6 mortal wounds, and the invocation's removed from play. So basically, it swings the axe. And then finally, your skull actors, your, or your skull alters your faction terrain. Um, you set it up anywhere, wholly within your territory, more than three from all their objectives and terrain features. It's defensible. Um, it can garrison with a single hero with eight or less wounds, and then invoke judgment. Um, while a Blades of Corn Priest is garrisoning it, double the range of its spare effects, and the summoning of invocations, and then Witchbane. Uh, while the terrain features of the senior rules on the battlefield, if a spell is miscast, they take d6 instead of d3 mortal wounds. And words of hate, you can reroll chanting rolls for friendly blades of corn priests that are holy within eight of this trade feature. So it makes your prayers real good. And considering one of your prayers is like a now 32 inch range push pull, and you can make your units move around, you want at least one priest that can cast two prayers sitting in that thing. I think every game just for that movement shenanigans, just for move one of my units during my hero phase, and then pull one of your units eight into combat with me, and now we're fighting. That's a huge deal. Or to you know be in charge range even. All right, let's talk points. Skull Cannon's 140. Uh, and then your battle line. Blood Letters are 180. Reavers are 80. Uh, Blood Warriors are 190. Claws of Karanak are 100. And their battle line core. Flush of Islands are 100 and battle line. Uh, Blood Crushers can be battle line if you have a Skull Master. Um, and they're 180. Mighty Skull Crushers can be battle line if uh, Lord of Corner Juggernaut's your one. And then Skull Reapers, if a Skull Fiend tribe, uh, they will be battle line. And the Mighty Skull Crushers are 200, the Skull Reapers are 190. Everything else, Aspiring Deathbringer is 80, Blood Master is 110, Blood Secretor is 110, Blood Stoker is 90, Drums 180, Deathbringer is 90, Hero Corn of Blood Thorns 160, Corgus Cool is 160, Mighty Lord of Corn on Juggernaut is 170, Mighty Lord of Corn is 130. Uh, the new ritual is only 100. Skyla is 110. Sky Blood Wrath is 100. The Skull Grinder is 90. Skull Master Herald of Corn is 130. Skull Taker is 140. Slaughter Priest is 110. Valkia is 140. All Blood Thirsters are 330 and Scarbrand's 380. Blood Crushers are 180. Uh, Garrick Shrievers are 70. Uh, 110 for a Korgrath, Megor's Fiends are 120, 200 for the Mighty Skull Crushers, like I said earlier. And then the Wrathmongers are 140. Bleeding Icons, 40. Hex Gorger Skulls are 50. Wrath Axe is 70, and your uh, Skull is free. And then for um, Faction Blades of Corn can ally with Beast of Chaos, excluding Zinch, Slanesh, and Wizard units only, although they can also be taken as um, Coalition Troops. I don't know why they'd be allies, too, because you can just take them in your army. Core, I guess you could take them on top of that as well. And that's it. So there we go, Blades of Corn, one of the OGest of OG Age of Sigmar factions. Um, I like the gloves for all the troops. I like the synergy of the priest and the skull altar, moving your stuff around, getting in combat. I like the streamlining of the blood tithe points and how they're spent. I think the battle tactics aren't great. They're gonna be hard to accomplish. You're gonna be focusing on the ones in the core book. Um, Although I maybe disagree with, I don't. I just feel like they're all very situational. What your opponent's doing, what your opponent's brought. So I don't. I don't trust them as much as I trust the universal ones. that tend to be more universally focused. Mm, I think that a lot of the units in here, especially blood letters, got a big glow up. Especially considering you can summon two wound letters now as well, uh, and they all have five plus wards until they get into combat is a huge deal for just sitting on objectives. That's a big deal. Uh, and everything got a little bit more consistent damage-wise and to hit-wise, which I think for an all-melee army is fantastic. I mean, they have a bit of 8-inch range shooting, but for the most part, you're getting in people's faces and playing super aggressively. Um, I have no idea how they're going to play, because I haven't seen this army on the table for a while. Andy plays them, and it's been a hot minute since he's played some AOS with me, um, and even then, they were very one-dimensional. I think leading into the prayer thing is going to be pretty powerful for them and I'd be excited to see them on the table. There it is. Uh, I like the book. I would say overall I like the book. I think that as far as leaning into the pitch battle stuff, I think it's 
the match play rules are the probably the, the least interesting or probably effective part of the list, but I think overall the profiles and the war scroll changes are really good. So, yeah, that's my GMG review. Thanks to GW for sending along the uh, digital copy to review, and for you guys for watching. Thanks on Ash. Have a good Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games already recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already, and have a look to the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week, and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model cost, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Death Ray Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements, like Last Days, Gamma Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.